Hello there YouTube, Devin here again, and today we're going to be doing a remake video as the weather is quite terrible outside, so I apologize if you hear any thunder, it's raining quite hard outside, so, um, but today we're going to be talking about the, uh, Germany's first kind of pseudo World War I helmet, um, they're very very rare nowadays, um, but that would be the, uh, Geda helmet. Um, so I've still not quite sure how to pronounce the man's name that this helmet is named after, um, but the Gaeta helmet, uh, Gaeta, uh, helmet, uh, is what we're, uh, is what the Germans told me how to pronounce it, um, um, but people that actually have this name, I have gotten, uh, basically, uh, three different responses from them. I've literally talked to people in, in the comments on my last video, uh, people have said it is pronounced Gaeta. Uh, gay de or gay d, um, but we're just gonna go with gay de uh, as uh, the person who came up with the idea for this helmet. Now, so 1914, Army Group gay de, uh, which is named after the commander in charge, uh, realized very early on, kind of before everybody else, through a study that head injuries were a real problem. So they decided to come up with a design uh, to help protect the soldier's head. Now this is actually a design that would be transferred over uh, later into the M16 Stahlhelm. So in 1915, uh, the general ordered uh, 2,500 uh, 2, helmets uh, like this to be made uh, for his frontline soldiers and they were all completed by the end of the year in his own personal artillery works for his army group and um, his field smithies and all that other stuff. So there's a bunch of variation in these. They're all kind of slightly different, um, but they basically consist of the same uh, incredibly heavy brow plate. They all have some form of kind of nose protector and stuff that sticks way out like this um, because your nose would stick out past the edge of the helmet and they don't want you to hurt your nose. So, and then it covers most of the head, like three quarters of it, and then it has this kind of adjustable leather liner, and this liner may look familiar to some of you because it would be used basically unchanged in the 1916 Stahlhelm. So, instantly when these came out, um, they weren't really well liked uh, by half the army and really, really well liked by the other half the army. So now the first group of people uh, who really didn't like them thought they were too heavy and to be fair they are quite heavy this is basically almost quarter inch thick steel or basically uh, three or four millimeter thick steel it's it's heavy this is a weighty helmet and for not covering all of your head it is incredibly heavy and they were used basically until the end of 1915 when the German army as a whole decided to come out with this design the Stahlhelm um, this isn't actually a 1916 Stahlhelm, it is a 1918 Stahlhelm, but the the design never changed. And this is just a shell right now, it's in the process of being repaired, so... But it is an original. So, you see, uh, it has this a big sweeping bill, it covers most of the head, it weighs a lot less, okay? But a couple design features from this helmet would, would stick as far as how to... Um, how this helmet would be used. So now these big lugs up here, double as ventils, the Frankenstein lugs as a lot of people call them, um, but these lugs are double as ventilation holes so they do go all the way all the way through into the inner side of the helmet and uh, these would be uh, used to hook a Sturmpanzer which is basically a big huge as thick as this face guard, well not really face guard, but helmet guard onto the front of this helmet that would make it more protective but incredibly heavy and it would have a little strap that would go around the back just to make sure it stays on. Um, but it would hook over these little lugs and you would give this to like machine gun troops or assault troops or something like that and it would actually stop most frontline rifle bullets. Um, this helmet is capable of stopping most frontline rifle bullets as well as pretty much every kind of shrapnel and everything like that, but it, it didn't cover most of the head, and you really don't need to wear this all the time. This was considered to be very, very, very heavy. So, and then of course the liner would be transferred over. Um, so if I put this on here to kind of show you how it would be worn, this is how the helmet would look being worn 
on somebody and to be fair it's actually quite comfortable as long as you have the liner rather tight or it's going to tend to walk forward but it's actually quite balanced I can look up it doesn't bite into the back of my head which is unfortunately something that the, the later Stahlhelm would do um, when you would go prone uh, to shoot your rifle uh, the back of the skirt of the helmet would kind of cut into your neck or into your uniform especially if you had equipment on uh, with the high colored uniforms that they had back then. This helmet does not do that. Uh, this helmet is also bulletproof to most frontline um, rifle rounds and machine gun rounds. Um, it's going to transfer a lot of energy into, into your head but you'll probably live. Um, it also protects your nose uh, which you would see with the bill on the 1916 Stahlhelm quite well. Uh, it does kind of obscure your vision, but it doesn't obscure your vision to the sides as much as the M16 Stahlhelm. But it does weigh a ton. This is an incredibly heavy helmet and it like it weighs on your neck. It hurts almost immediately um, after a, a couple minutes of wearing it. So, um, But it's it was overall uh, an approved design and you would see features carried over it. Unfortunately in 1915 a lot of them would be taken and melted down and turned into Stahlhelms and artillery guns and ships and other pieces because uh, they were like, well, we don't need these anymore. We're going to have uh, a standard helmet for everybody. And uh, But a few of them did survive the war and they were really well liked by stormtroops because they allowed you to hear better. Uh, the stormtroops really, really liked them later on, the few surviving examples, um, because you could hear better at night and you could see better, but they still offered the, the protection of like the Sturm pants, the like head on, like full on rifle protection. So, um, but like later, as we'll see if I put on this, uh, so this has no liner in it, so it sits kind of low. It would be sitting up here actually. Um, so I'll just have to hold it. You could see that there is a huge bill on the front that sticks out to protect your nose. Uh, but you can see this skirt here in the back. If I was to go prone, right there I could feel it on my neck it, it, it touches your neck and that's not good so you see a lot of stormtroopers and everybody during World War one turning their helmets backwards like this um, because it doesn't really obstruct your vision anymore but because it's higher cut in the front for that bill uh, you can go prone fully with this and still be able to see without the helmet rocking forward and ob obscuring your sight um, it had a big skirt that comes down all the way around the back to protect your spine, uh, which the Gaeta helmet does not have. It only has this kind of leather covering as part of the liner. Um, and then it has stuff to come around the sides, which is going to help protect your hearing. But unfortunately, this helmet um, uh, rings like a bell. Uh, if I wasn't holding it with my hand to absorb all the shock, this helmet rings. Uh, so it also kind of doubled as the fact that it deafened people. This thing uh, does not ring. It's pretty solid. It doesn't really do a whole lot. So, um, But hopefully this will kind of correct and remake a bit of that video because a lot of people gave me shit for not being able to, to know uh, w how to pronounce the guy's name. But without being able to ask him, considering he died probably a century ago, um, or over a century ago, I have no way of asking him how he personally pronounced his name. So this is just how the uh, videos are gonna have to be. So I gave you the three examples of how his name might have been pronounced based on people that have that name that are related to him and how the Germans actually think it was pronounced because yeah, the Germans get pretty rough with the pronunciations when you do them wrong. Um, but thank you so much you guys for stopping by. This is going to be a nice uh, remake video here so and hopefully I will see all of you guys in the next video. Bye!